Yeah, so great to be here. I've already made contact with maybe not any new friends yet, but old friends, people that worked. What is that? Is that a New York subway or a Brooklyn that, subway? OK. Well, I thought it was us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My stomach growling. No. Um, oh, I thought I just saw a, a Pixel phone in the air instead of an iPhone. Did I see that? <gasps> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Your work is done. <laughs> yeah, my work is done. No, no. Um, seen a lot of great old friends, some people that worked for me, some people I worked for. And you know, I grew up in New York and also lived in Brooklyn. So it's great to be here. So I'm Ivy. And I'm, and I'm Susan. And we are really thrilled to be here. Um, when you were talking, Tina, about creative mornings, um, it made me think about the last four years that I have had creative mornings starting at 4.30 in the morning working on this book. And so it's really sort of like, these are my people, too. And Sam, I would like to listen to you talk all day. So thank you for the manifesto. Really beautiful. Really beautiful. Yep. So as Tina already said, um, you know, we believe that we're standing on the verge of a cultural shift in which the arts can deliver potent, accessible, proven health and well-being solutions to billions of people. And when Susan reached out to me five years ago and told me what her lab was doing, which was proving what I knew and a lot of you know intuitively that the arts are critical for our health and well-being, I was like, yes, but the masses don't know, so let's do this together. So, you know, we've been optimizing for productivity, I think, since the Industrial Revolution, pushing the arts aside and making them a luxury, thinking that the focus on productivity only would make us happy, but we're not. I think that experiment has failed. And in fact, we're seeing the impact of that in the surge of mental health issues. They're now sur actually surpassing physical health issues. And we believe it's essential to come back to our senses, the things that we know alive in us, what we're seeking more than ever on an individual and societal levels is transformation. And the arts in all forms are a gateway to this transformation. And I just want to start out by saying when we say the arts, we just listed some of them up here, but we're not just talking visual arts. We're talking visual arts, digital arts, design, sculpture, architecture, and so much more. So this is an exciting time where the science and the arts are coming together to show us that, in fact, we are wired for art. So the, when we began to really think about this idea of being wired for art, we really started to go back and look at how the arts were used historically. And you know, it turns out that there are over 5,000 active tribes around the world that are still using the arts in their day to day. And there actually isn't a word for art because it's so much ingrained in what people are doing. And I think, as Ivy was saying, in many ways, in modern culture, modern society, we've really forgotten that. This is an image of a Colombian cave rock painting that really represents day-to-day -day life and the ways that people really just lived the art. Another example of this is a piece that was found by a geologist named David Zhang, and it's actually 226,000 years old. And if you look really closely, you can see hand prints that have been sort of uh, chipped into the rock and also feet. And what I think it really illustrates is that we've been using those tools, our hands primarily, to really craft our world as a maker since the beginning of time. And as Ivy mentioned, this idea around arts and aesthetic experiences have been something that we've used um, for self-expression, for communications, for collaboration, for reflecting, for healing, and also for flourishing. And so when we were researching the book, we had the opportunity to meet with E.O. Wilson, who is an evolutionary biologist. He passed away a couple years ago. But what he shared with us is that this ability for humans to make and create, to create story, to create images, to dance, to message with each other, to express ourselves is really essential and fundamental for how we've really developed as a species. And I think biologically, we've learned that the arts absolutely are there because of the ability for us to connect to these sensorial systems, touch, taste, sound, smell. And so I um, want to talk a little bit about sort of this idea of what do our sensory systems really do? And you know, often I think we've been so transactional that we haven't really remembered always that the only way that we bring the world in through our bodies is through our senses. And so just a couple of things to share. 
um, from, from a vision point of view, you know, vision is extremely complex. It works very similarly to a camera. And it's really the optic nerve that sends these signals to the back of your head, to the occipital lobe. And interestingly, we now know that in a, in a single hour, you process about 36,000 visual images. Think about that, 36,000 in just a single image. And it's estimated that you probably process around 25 million images throughout your lifespan. So when you start to really understand the power of the visual system, it's extraordinary. Um, and thinking about touch, um, we know that we have about 4 million sensory nerves in throughout our exterior of our body. Just in your fingertips alone, you have over 3,000 nerve endings. So just think about how when you're touching things. In your feet, each of your feet has about 200,000 nerve endings. And they're really, really responsible for the way that neuropeptides like oxytocin, which is sort of considered the love hormone, releases. Or think about serotonin or dopamine. So this ability to touch is sort of a superpower, whether you're touching materials, texture, or whether we're touching each other. And then just last, thinking a little bit about scent and smell. And so we know that smell is probably the oldest sense that first to evolve, and that your nose can literally detect 400, um, it can detect, can detect over one trillion odors with 400 different scent receptors. Um, and interestingly, you know, you bring these, everything kind of releases a molecule that you bring in through your nose. Your nose actually turns over those cells every 60, to, every 20, 30 to 60 days. So your body is actually renewing so that you're ready to be able to take in these new experiences. And so I think it's really amazing that just how our body really brings in the world. And we'll talk a little bit about what happens when, after that happens. So our hearing is registered quickly in about three milliseconds. And the way sound works in the body is fascinating. Um, those of you who know me in this audience know I've been studying sound and vibration for about 35 years now. But um, the sounds we hear are caused by the motion in our eardrums, which causes fluid in your inner ear to move. The fluid inside the inner ear bends hairs on the cells, which convert to nerve impulses that travel to your brain. These impulses move through the brain via neural networks and evoke strong emotions and memories, altering moods and behaviors instantly. Different tempos, languages, and sound levels affect your emotion, mental activities, and physical reactions. Researchers have learned how brain waves correlate to musical beats per second, and our brains will entrain to the beat of the music, which is why I think when we're all dancing together, we are feeling, you know, one. <laughs> Um, our brains will entrain, pulling us into all these different states, including alpha for relaxation and delta for sleep. But you know, there's a difference between music and sound. I mean, sound becomes an excellent tool to regulate stress, and that it can work on an unconscious level. The frequency of sound instantly taps into what lies underneath conscious recognition, literally changing the vibrations in your body. Sound vibrations have the capacity to return the body to homeostasis and out of the fight, flight, freeze reaction. I've been known in some of my corporate jobs to carry tuning forks and a hockey puck in my knapsack. And if someone is like stressed out in a meeting, I will take out my tuning fork, strike them, hold them up to their ears, and it's like <laughs> um, There's a scientific theory being studied now about how sound frequency increases our body's natural production of nitric oxide, which would explain how sound alleviates stress. Nitric oxide enhances cell vitality and vascular flow and may account for the relaxation effect in the body. Several small studies have shown that sound frequencies from these tuning forks, as well as humming, causes nitric oxide to be released in our cells. So this is interesting. These are um, pictures of my and Susan's actual voice made visible. You'd have to know us better to know which <laughs> is which. Um, but there's a science called cymatics, which is making sound visible, which was started back in the 50s. So our actual voices were put through a scientific instrument called a cymoscope that John Reed developed in the early 2000s. And it literally imprints sonic vibration from our voice on the surface of ultra pure water while a camera films those patterns going on in the water. Looking down at it, 
So by making sound visible, along with the knowledge that our own bodies are made up of 60% water, you can begin to understand um, the impact sound has on us. And to show you some of this in action, um, here's a short example of vowel sounds being expressed by a woman and watch how the patterns are formed in the water. E And then this is how it might come together in a sentence. I'ma make sure that you feel alive. I'ma make sure that you feel alive. I'ma make sure that you feel alive. You know, the amazing thing when you think about this is um, the profound effect because we're 60% we're water, and you can see how vibrations affect water, that the importance of the words we say to each other um, and the importance of singing, um, what it does to our bodies. Um, this red quilt is made up of a series of photos taken of human heart cells under a microscope in a lab at Stanford University. A cardiologist there named Sean Wu wanted to generate heart tissue in the lab in order to create models that would help explain certain cardiac diseases. So heart cells are incredibly complex and challenging to create. Heart cells are also densely packed, allowing them to work in tandem and beat. If they're designed too far apart, they won't sink. Too close together, they could smother and die. So they worked with an acoustic bioengineer at Stanford to move the heart cells around with sound. So what's amazing is there's a growing number of biomedical researchers tapping into aesthetics like sound waves to design cellular structures. You know, you could change the frequency and amplitude of the cells move, move by, um, in order to move the cells into a new spot right in front of your eyes, suggesting these different structural patterns. So this begs the question, is life becoming art? The ancients knew what Julie Bolt Taylor, a neuroanatomist, is telling us here in this quote. Most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel, but we are actually feeling creatures that think. We now know that we experience over 34,000 different feelings. So just take that in for a minute, because I do think most of us walk around thinking that we are thinking beings first that have learned how to feel once in a while. But if you think about that we are actually designed by the universe to be feeling beings first, that more recently have just learned to think, um, you know, where would you put your focus? So when Susan and I um, first connected, one of the first projects we did together was in the spring of 2019, it gave, this project gave us the opportunity to actually put neuroaesthetic principles into action to illustrate the effects of sensory perceptions on our body in an exhibit called A Space for Being. So it was an exhibit of enriched environments, default mode network, and the aesthetic triad, which we'll learn about later. And this was a collaboration through Google, uh, my Google design group, Susan's Lab at Hopkins, and an architect named uh, Suchi Reddy. So this was at the Milan Design Fair at Salone. So participants walked into the space where they were fitted with a custom band containing sensors that were constantly taking in the individual's biological information. Um, it was a algorithm that Susan's lab and Google had worked on that equaled uh, your body being uh, the least stress or feeling the most at ease. That's what we were after, is what is in which space um, which I'll talk about in a minute, is your body, not your mind, feeling the most comfortable 
or least stressed. Um, so participants were invited to touch, smell, listen, and explore for five minutes in each of three different rooms. There was no talking, no photos, no devices, only about 10 people in each of these rooms at a time. We invited them to touch the art, feel the couch. We had um, custom scents, custom music, and each room was designed with a, um, three very different neuroaesthetic principles um, that affected the choice of colors and textures and materials and scent and lighting that we did in each of these rooms. At the end of the experience, the guests took off their bands and gave it to a band tender, not a bartender, um, and their data was downloaded for them only, because we're Google, we deleted it. Um, but <laughs> The, the great thing was that we... Full disclosure. Yeah. Um, the beautiful thing is, and first of all, we wanted to walk our talk. We, I wanted to make sure that the data was displayed as aesthetic as possible. So each visitor actually received a personalized data visualization revealing in which space their bodies felt the most at ease or most relaxed. So, and you know, this conclusion was based on real-time biological feedback uh, being fed into the algorithm we developed, Susan and I had said, oh my God, this will be a failure if at least 50% of the people, their, the room their mind thought they liked the best would be different than the room their body liked the best. And thank God or goddess, sure enough, 58% um, of the people, because we would say to them, well, which room did you like the best? And they'd say the first one or the third one or the second one. And then we would show them the algorithms and and it, might, and it was, in 58%, a different room. And they're like, how could that be? And it's like, yes. Because that proved the point that you could walk into a space and um, intellectually or in your mind go, I like this space, or I saw it in a magazine. It, but your body may not be, your sensory systems and your body may not be feeling at ease or at home. And so I remember a lot of journalists said, oh, is Google going to do a band? That you? I said, I don't want to live in a world where you have to wear a band to say how you feel. I, this, this, was, this was really being done to, first of all, show that we are embodied. You know, we think we're just minds walking around. And that we're feeling and sensing and taking in this information that goes into our brains unconsciously all the time. And so the idea is you have agency over the spaces you're in and what you create. And to be aware and conscious of the power of the fact that we are feeling beings first. And maybe to tie into the theme of acceptance, you know, agency is really about accepting what you can't change, but changing what you can. And I think that's where this idea of when you know how your body feels, you really have the ability to do that. So as Ivy mentioned, the exhibition was the first time that the public really had a real experience with what we call neuroaesthetics or neuro arts. And just to kind of give you a little bit of information about what this word means, this sort of $100 bill, neuroaesthetics words. It's really simply the study of how the arts and um, aesthetic experiences measurably change your brain, body, and behavior. And importantly for us, how this information, how this information can be used in health, well-being, learning, community development. So we're very interested in how this work can be applied. And it turns out that it's only been in the last 20 years that we've been able to non-invasively get inside our heads to really understand the neurobiology of the arts and aesthetic experiences. And these experiences alter a complex physiological network of interconnected neurobiological and physiological systems. And so what that means is that when you're listening to music or you're dancing or you're making art or you're drawing, that your body is using multiple systems. So it's using sort of neural, neurobiology, but it's also using physiology and systems are engaging at the same time. And there are really virtually no other kinds of experiences that are using these same multiple systems simultaneously. So there's a huge power of the arts that we're really just beginning to understand. Um, these systems are connected, as we were talking about, as we bring in the world. And this is really called neuroplasticity. So just to give you a little bit of understanding about what we mean by neuroplasticity, um, you were born with 100 billion neurons. So you are come into this world ready to learn, ready to bring in the world. And the way you do that is through your sensory systems, as I shared earlier. 
your sensory systems really engage those neurons and through what's called synaptic um, transmission, your synapses connect each neuron to one another. And through that process, you're creating neural pathways. And these neural pathways literally sculpt into your brain and encode memories into your hippocampus and, and other parts of the brain. So to illustrate that um, in a, an experiment in the 60s, there was a neuroscientist named Marion Diamond who developed an experiment that provided enriched environments, so environments that were novel, had surprise, had lots of things to do that felt safe. And what she found was that when mice or rats were in these enriched environments, in just two weeks, their brain mass or their cerebral cortex increased by about 6%. And this was the first time that we'd ever seen a structural change, mass change in size in the brain. Now, fast forward to where we are today, we now have this non-invasive technology to be able to understand how things like enriched environments change the human brain. And we know that there's huge capacity changes when we create these enriched environments. So just to backtrack for a second, um, these structural changes, again, happen through enriched environments, sensory, strong sensory systems, and this whole idea around the science of the senses is becoming more and more relevant. We talked about taste and, and, and sound and, and smell and hearing, but um, and the, I think the space for being also showed that our, not just our brains, but our bodies also change on these experiences. So we now know that we only um, consciously pr uh, process about 5% of what is happening in terms of our mental activity. Um, but that mental activity is really, all these experiences are happening to us in a physiological way, an emotional way, and in a sensorial way. And so the way that happens is when you're bringing this information in is through what we call salient experiences. And those are the experiences that are really um, important to you, that um, are important to you either for emotional reasons or for practical reasons. And we've, we've spent a little bit of time thinking about what that looks like. So, next slide. So um, this is an illustration that's in our book by Greg Dunn, and it really depicts the way the brain brings in the sensory system information, but also this idea around the salient, salient experiences. So you can sort of see in the sort of top here, this sort of blue um, watercolor area. What we know is that the saliency network is really in place to be able to help us process this information. And it comes through multiple systems, but also sort of seems to regulate around that prefrontal midbrain area. Um, and it happens um, when, you know, so we bring the world in through something called the central executive network, but the way we process that information is through something called the default mode network. So the default mode network, if you think about um, sort of what, what's called the seat of self, this is the default mode network. This is where you make meaning of the world, where you connect the dots, where you daydream or mind wander. And interestingly, the default met network goes to work when you're quiet, when you're in a pause, when you're not bringing the world in. And so uh, I think all of us that are creatives know that you need downtime, you need time to reflect, to go into nature, which is the most aesthetic art form, um, but to really be able to give yourself time to be able to process as information. And what we also know is that because of the way we bring the world in differently, each of our brains are really as unique as our fingerprints. And so it's really interesting when you start to think about what are those experiences that you're bringing in and how do you think about processing them. And just I'll take it one step further. This is a, a model by a neuroscientist named Anjan Chatterjee. And it's called the aesthetic um, triad. And basically it looks at three different things. The first is what's called knowledge meaning or sort of where you come from and what you know. The second is called sensory motor and it's really your physiological systems that you engage when you are in an experience. And then the third is emotional evaluation and that's how you feel about something. Does it make you happy? Does it make you sad? At the middle of those intersecting circles is where you have um, your own aesthetic experiences or moments that are achieved. And the more salient those experiences are, the more peak those experiences or those aesthetic experiences are going to be. 
So we wanted to give you sort of five takeaways to sort of um, think about this work at large. And the first is that we have the proof. As we mentioned, over the last 20 years, the technology is helping us get inside the brain. So in other words, scientists are catching up to artists and starting to really understand what's happening. The second is that this is a highly interdisciplinary field, so neuroscientists, cognitive science, psychology, public health, and so many other disciplines, artists, people with lived experiences are part of this. And third, that the research is proving that we are literally wired for art and that it is including all of these multi-complex systems in our bodies that are really engaged when we are in an art or aesthetic experience. By the way, I love the fact that science kicked out art when Sputnik came in and they said, okay, now art, I mean, science and math, science and math, and now science is coming full circle and validating how important art is. Uh, it's, For it's, so many reasons, right? Yeah, it's we'll great. We'll talk about that. So the other, the second takeaway is that there's an art for that, meaning that um, there is such a huge range of arts. I mean, and arts and aesthetics are not a nice to have, but they're essential to our very uh, survival. Uh, it's the underpinning of the prerequisite for human growth and development that has continued to expand, and it's so needed right now. I mean, our sense of imagination is extremely important. Um, so the bottom line is that the arts positively impact every area of your life, including your physical and mental health, and the book is divided into chapters, physical, mental, community, thriving, learning, because these are all aspects of what the arts can do for you. Um, some fascinating facts is that 20 minutes a day of art is as important for your health as getting enough exercise and sleep. I mean, it's interesting, until science proved to us that exercise was imperative to our health, we didn't start doing it. Um, and now we're proving that art is extremely important, for at least 20 minutes a day. 45 minutes of practicing art reduces the stress hormone cortisol. Playing music increases synapses and gray matter, which supports cognitive skills. Um, one or more art experiences a month can extend your life by 10 years. Um, so that is just, there's a ton of other fun facts in the book, but those are just some to get you going. So anywhere, anytime, anybody is another real takeaway, which is it's not age dependent, it's not gender dependent, it's not income dependent, um, and also, I think a really important finding is that you don't have to be good at it. You don't have to be talented in order for the arts to have significant impact. Yeah, that's super important because so many people have said, oh my God, you gave me permission to make art again because so many of us did it as a kid. It wasn't what we were going to do to make money or someone told us we weren't any good and we put it aside, um, which is crazy. <laughs> so the... Next takeaway is the future is immersive and sustainable. You know, I was talking to someone earlier. We, we have a chapter called The Art of the Future, but what we're seeing is a lot of these art experiences are becoming immersive, and I think part of that is to get us out of our cognitive mind, whatever it's going to take to get us out of our heads and into our bodies and into our senses. Um, this is something uh, called chromosonic in L.A., that is this incredible womb-like shape that you go into uh, 10 people at a time, eyes open, 30-minute experience, where they've engineered it so that you are almost hearing sound uh, and, and seeing colors that correlate. And you come out of there fully present, because I think your, your monkey mind has gone away, and you, um, your brain has had to make sense of the color and the sound. But we're seeing a lot of these kinds of experiences um, more and more. And so we think the universe is telling us we need to alive. And you know, when our senses are lit up, that's where we feel alive, and that we need to give our brains a break and get, into, get out of our cognitive mind. And then the fifth is change your lens, change your world. And Ivy and I talk a bit about a kaleidoscope where if you just slightly change your lens, you start to be able to see the world in a very different way. And in the book, we uh, coined a term called the aesthetic mindset that really just looks at four things. And these are four things that I think many of you do, but um, just to kind of bring them forward. One is curiosity and really having a capacity for curiosity. The second is playful or exploration. So coming into situations, not critiquing, not judging. 
The third is sensory awareness, being much more aware of light and sound and touch and color and temperature. And the last is a passion for making and beholding and being in that dance of maker and beholder um, throughout our day. And by the way, not only, first of all, the opposite of play is not work, it's depression, and that's a longer conversation. <laughs> Secondly, um, this idea that not only do you not have to be good at it to get the health benefit, but we're also talking about whether you're the maker or the beholder, which is a whole other conversation, meaning just beholding art or looking at it. You don't have to be the creator of it. So our last slide is to say that art is our one true global language. It speaks to our need to reveal, heal, and transform. It transcends our ordinary lives and lets us imagine what is possible. And this was a quote from Richard Kamler that we love. So thank you very much. And, and, and keep on, keep on arting. We're trying to figure out what's the verb for making art. Arting, it doesn't sound right. If any of you have another idea. We've never found a word. Mm -mm. But um, there's not a word for it. Yeah, I guess not. You just have to do it. You have to feel it and know it. Um, I think it's Q&A time, yes. right? Yes. Thank you so much, Ivy and Susan. This was really inspiring. Should we give it another round of applause? No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yes. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have a question. Can you stand up and introduce yourself? Just very quickly. Hi, my name is Mashad. Thank you so much. I have two questions. One, do you have copies of the book here? Unfortunately, we tried to get them here uh, from a local bookstore, but we couldn't. But okay. there is definitely, it was out of, it was sold out for a while, but it's back um, available in stock on Amazon and other local bookstores. So I think there's two bookstores near here that have them, right? We just couldn't get them to come over here. So, um, yeah, and then okay. just carry it with you, and I'll, we'll see you in the streets someday. And we'll <laughs> yeah, audit, totally. We'll, we'll sign it. I'll find you. Oh, uh, you'll find um, me. The second question was, which, um, your tuning forks, that like the parasympathetic tuning forks, which key it was do you carry? C, those particular ones I carry are C and G, because, you know, G. there's like, there's all these theories of um, which notes, which, but C and G, uh, is the frequency of the center of the earth, they say. So it's a very grounding combination. Um, I should mention, for those of you in sound, we, it's in the book, but a woman at MIT is now using sound, 440 hertz, and... 40 hertz. 40 hertz, sorry. And a sequence of certain colors to help um, dementia and Alzheimer's. So literally, um, she did it by first experimenting with making a huge piece of equipment that people had to sit in front of for like an hour just absorbing this particular frequency and sequence of colors. And now she just recently got some FDA clearance, some investment, and looking to make smaller devices that people could use because that, that combination clears some of the plaque in the brain. Um, so, you know, those of you who saw, I remember when I saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind, remember when they landed and they had that sequence of colors and sound? I felt this truth in my body that they knew something we didn't know. Well, the MIT work is really, it, like these heart cells you saw, is really an example of using sensorial systems, right? Using light and sound to be able to break a plaque and then to have it leave through the waste system of the brain. So that's coming and that's not symptom relief or prevention. It's actually curing, looking at curing disease. So I think it's really exciting, very promising. Yeah, think about the future of medicine being art. Wouldn't that Whoa. be great? <laughs> I have a question from Juliana on art live stream. Medicine. The I'm art right of medicine, yeah. <laughs> um, a live stream question. Thank you, Kyle. Juliana is asking, I'm very curious if the positive effects of view viewing are maximized if the experience is more intentional versus more passive. Does conscious attention influence outcome? That's a great question. Um, well, so... Let me talk about doodling for a minute. <laughs> it turns out that when you're doodling, you're actually able to uh, pay more attention, to be more present, to be able to re recall information, and to be able to um, uh, memorize things better. So I would argue that not being intentional about being in a physical environment and using something like doodling is, is actually very productive. Um, there is some research that does look at intentional viewing. So there's some work called visual teaching strategies that's been being used by fourth year medical students and, and, and some other 
domains as well, where you're intentionally looking at a piece of art with others, and you're really, um, without judgment, identifying what's there. So there's three questions. One is, what do you see? And people respond to what they see and intentionally. And then the second is, what else do you see? And then the third question is, is there anything else that you see? And <laughs> amazing, right? And what they find is that observation increases, empathy increases, understanding of the other, and perspective taking increases. Hi, my name is Neha. Thank you so much for this talk, really fascinating. Um, I have a question around AI. So just curious to, look, to hear from you, you know, being in tech and science and also meshing that with the arts, what's your take on how AI is gonna impact our ability to perceive what is, I guess, non-AI versus what is artificial and how is that gonna affect our ability to process that information? Yeah, that question is a whole other talk, probably. Um, but what I will say is I do think AI is going to take some things off our plate, some fundamental things, and allow us to be more creative. And I think what it's going to push us to do is be more imaginative in terms of how do we then take that and build on it. And it'll push us to places that us humans are capable of that we can't, we can't even imagine right now because we haven't exercised that muscle. It's just like when digital photography came in. I know we were all, and traditional uh, photographers were all bummed. And then you look at what's happened, the creativity with digital photography. So I am on the side of um, let's use it to propel us to a, you know, see it as a base, a framework that it might enable us to take certain things off our plate, which the truth is machines probably could do, but we have to understand and ask ourselves the question, what is it to be human and preserve that and then pull the lever and amplify that on top of some of these frameworks that are gonna come in. That's the only way I know how to deal with it. That's the way I, true to, I, I, I care to inspire myself to think about the possibilities. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a really interesting time to, the, with the writer's strike, I don't know how many of you are writers. In the, so there's some, been some really great stories about AI coming into screenwriting and, um, and, and how that gets used and how, that, how IP works, but also I think how writers may choose to use AI in a creative problem solving, creative writing process, and that's gonna be on an individual level. Um, we had someone recently uh, read into um, AI how they felt about reading our book. I don't know if you saw this. No, I did. Oh my God, this is amazing. So we're, we have lots and lots of people reading the book and responding to it. And this guy actually created a piece of art and it turned out to be a brain that had all these colors oh, yes, in it. Did, did you see it. that? It was really it, yeah. interesting. And then what was more interesting was the notes that people wrote. And they said, it seems insincere. It doesn't seem human. It doesn't have feeling. I don't like it. You know, and so it got a real pushback about how people felt about what was created. So discerning what is made by a person, what is made using you know, AI, I think it's going to be really interesting on how we start to what we feel, what we know, and I think there's gonna be some studies about AI-generated art versus people, person-generated art, and seeing kind of, is there a different part of the brain? Are we processing differently? I mean, yeah. I think it's all real new information. Yeah, and timing's everything. I was thinking the other day that this book, which is trying to encourage us all to understand our sensory systems and how we alive in them, that's what we're going to have to continue to do, because uh, we may have sensors in technology, but. Um, AI doesn't have sensory systems, is that we need to exercise that, like get out of our heads and, and what does it mean to be uniquely human and amplify that part of us. Because to your point, I think there will, we will always have to have that um, emotional, that poetry, that other piece co-creating with AI. To understand the world. And, yeah. and we talk about sensorial literacy. We don't teach that. We don't teach our kids. We don't teach each other how our, sens our sensory systems work, how miraculous they are, and how we have those available to us right now. Yeah, nor do we teach our kids to express themselves, which is what all this creativity is about, right? It's expressing ourselves freely and creatively, and I think often we shut that down. 
And um, we did a lot of work, and there's some, we interviewed over 100 people, so there's some stories, and it has to do with trauma. And we have, we have micro traumas every day, and we just keep repressing it, repressing it, and that's why part of the reason we get, get sick, if you express it, like, come home that night, you know, write a secret down. You don't even have to tell anyone, just writing it uh, lowers your cognitive load. So this is really about also learning as a society to express ourselves, and creativity is a great way to express ourselves, even if we do it just for ourselves. Twenty minutes a day. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, there's so, um, someone over here. Hi, I'm Liliana, and um, I. Before asking my question, I want to thank you because you gave us. I don't know, but for me, you validate my life and my ex, my relationship to art and performance. Um, not that I work as an artist right now. But um, I, I wanted to ask about those of us who feel like we are in creative fields, but it's work. Um, are you? Do we still have to? I mean, I, I feel like because there are creative opportunities and outlets in my day, that I'm like sort of being fulfilled, but at the same time, I'm not. Do you still recommend that we have our own separate time for play? Like, is there? Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. There's no totally. substitute. Yeah. So play is one of the definitions. Um, or the best definition is doing something different than you do every day, but without any expected outcome. You know, I'm creative at work, that's my job, but it's very transactional because everything I do, there's an expected outcome that I have to deliver. The definition of play is doing something different than you do every day without any preconceived expectations. So I know I love coming home and taking a lump of clay and just starting to play with it without worrying about what is it going to look like, what's the end result, just doing it. And so even for those of us that do creative jobs, I think allowing yourself the permission to play in that way in these different art forms without any expectations is the key. And if you need an idea, dance, dance, dance. <laughs> dance is so good for you. It's so good for you. I mean, instantaneously, mentally and physiologically. Yeah, you know, when you think about it, communities knew that, right? Square dancing, all these things that we used to do as a group. <laughs> She's dating herself. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how to square dance. But I saw Why pictures did you say that? that that's what they do. No, we'll, we'll, we'll fast forward and contemporize ourselves. We... We were, we were in dialogue with um, David Burns of Talking Heads, and he talked about, even during COVID, what he did, um, what was it called, Dance Social Club? Social Distance Dance Club. Yeah, which was fantastic. And he told us, there's a great story in there about how, um, and, and things I didn't know about him, about how his creative creativity overcame certain um, and it, it, challenges Being an introvert, he had. being very introverted. Yeah, do you believe he's an introvert at heart? <laughs> You would that's never how he believe expressed that. himself, and dance was huge, and the synchronicity of dancing together made him feel comfortable with others, and then sharing his voice and people m mimicking back to him. So we all have our ways of becoming a community, and for him, that was it. Thank you, my name is Janine Robinson. Um, thank you for your work, I'm looking at everyone and you guys are giving proof, like everyone's on the edge of their seats of like what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. um, and so thank you for that work. Uh, my question is, have you, and speaking of square dancing, have you done, <laughs> done like a lot of times when we go to a lot, a lot more indigenous cultures, like you showed the cave paintings, um, and even indigenous cultures now, the singing, the art, the, it's such an integral part. And for me and my experience when I, and in those environments, it feels like it's having an impact. So I was wondering in your research, have you found how we impact, like those communities are, I feel, are impacting me. And so I was just curious if you found anything around that. So we, um, we did a couple things. There's a group called Sweetwater Foundation. Um, you, there, you, can, you can Google them. Um, they're in the south side of Chicago. And they took over 12 blocks of vacant property, you know, burned out buildings, and co-created a brand new community. And so I, I share that in, in terms of thinking about, you know, they brought all of the things that they individually knew and then did something that Maria Rosario Jackson calls, she's the head of the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, she calls 
creating culture kitchens. And so what she did, what she talks about is that sometimes our cultures have been eradicated, they've been, we've been marginalized, we don't have those sort of ways of knowing. And so to be able to come together and mess around, play with what is our ritual, what is our tradition, what is the way that we um, want to build spaces and communities. And I think Creative Mornings is actually an example of that. You've co-created this community. But for sure, indigenous cultures, rituals, traditions, the way that they honor the earth, all, every single indigenous culture honors the earth, right? Yeah, and we, they live that way. Yeah, we interviewed um, Hopi and Maori um, folks who, I mean, it's when we realized, because we went back and said, wait a minute, when did the word art even get created? But those tr tribes and all of those indigenous tribes, if you look at all they were doing, that was life, was the arts. It was storytelling, dancing, singing, painting. And so that is who we are as peoples. <laughs> and that's what I mean. And I think over time, we let go of that um, and became modern and abandoned that. And it's time to, and because we put all of our effort into Productivity, you know, abandon that. Now we're going to be productive, and we have got to go backwards to move forward, yeah. and bring some of that here back into our lives. I think we're. I think. Oh. <laughs> I, just one other thought. You talk about how good it feels to be in an indigenous culture, and I think that's because that's going home. Right, that's us going home and we're seeing what we've forgotten. And that's really kind of what I think we're trying to show you through the biology is that it only makes sense because it's how we're wired.